the other thing he noted, which is a fascinating obs observation that remarkably has gone completely un unquestioned in medical science, is he asked, why are there no intellectual seizures? We've, we know about seizures. You know, people can fall down, they shake all over, or you can have milder seizures where you just move a limb, or your face twitches, or whether you, or you have an abnormal smell, or have visual phenomena. But you never start doing calculus when you have a seizure. <laughs> and you never contemplate justice, and you, 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 you never contemplate political science. And the question is, well, if the brain, if large portions of the brain are devoted to higher intellectual functioning, why don't seizures occasionally make you do, make you take second derivatives instead of just jerk your arm? And they never, ever do. In 30 years of practice, I've never seen a seizure have any intellectual evocation. And Penfield asked, why are there no intellectual seizures? So his answer as to why he could not find agency by stimulating the brain and why he never observed an, an intellectual seizure was that the intellect and the will in human beings is not in the brain. It's not material. The brain mediates it, but doesn't give rise to it. The second line of research was that of Roger Sperry, uh, who is a Nobel laureate, was a Nobel laureate, working at Caltech. And Sperry studied split brain patients. You may have heard of these people. They're patients who've had surgery in which uh, the hemispheres of their brain are surgically disconnected. Uh, we actually cut through a fiber bundle between the hemispheres so that their brain now really is two brains, essentially. There are connections deeper down, but they don't connect the hemispheres very effectively. And um, this is done to, to stop seizures. There are rare kinds of seizures that start in one hemisphere and spread to the other that if you can disconnect the hemispheres, the seizures are much milder and much easier to live with. So these op operations have been done really since, uh, since the 1930s. And they work very well. And Sperry uh, took these patients and he studied them in detail because he wanted to ask what happens to someone's mind when you cut their brain in half. And the, the, the remarkable result of Sperry's work isn't what he won the Nobel Prize for. He won the Nobel Prize because he found a whole bunch of subtle perceptual changes, very, very interesting things. The remarkable thing was that he had to do Nobel Prize level research to find any difference at all. That is, I've, I've known many of these patients. I've, I've done the surgery. These are normal people. You meet, you meet them, I talk to them, their brains are cut in half, but they're still one person. They're completely unitary. They don't have two minds. They don't have two intellects or two wills. None of that. The only differences they have are subtle perceptual things. For example, the left hemisphere is usually the speech hemisphere. And if you have your brain cut in half, only something presented to the, your right visual field, which is the visual field that your left hemisphere sees, can you speak about. You can't speak about things in your left visual field that your right hemisphere sees because your right hemisphere doesn't have speech. Now, what people do is they'll look and they'll, 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 they'll cheat, even unconsciously. So there are perceptual differences, and there are differences that won Sperry a Nobel Prize for figuring out, but they're very subtle. Your intellect, your will, your sense of self is still unitary, even though your brain is split in half. So what Sperry showed, in the same way that Penfield showed, that agency, and intellect in human beings is immaterial, Sperry showed that the mind is metaphysically simple. It can't be cut. You can't split the mind. Uh, but you, you can split the brain, but not the mind.